It's good to be back in the mansion house. It seems like only last month um, that I was at a, here at a conference, which turns out to be 27 years ago, uh, when I was on the organisation committee for the 1995 Lord Mayor's Agenda 21 conference. Sorry, I just need to unmute this mic here. Sorry, Michael, for breaking your flow there. Um, the 1995 uh, Lord Mayor's Agenda 21 conference, which was organised by Antashka, but also by, um, by John Gormley, who was Lord Mayor at the time, and, and Sive. <laughs> so it's a little bit like the band has got back together again today. Um, of course, John was Lord Mayor at the time, um, but it's interesting to look at the themes, and there's some other familiar faces I'm seeing around the place here who are involved in that as well. Um, but it's interesting to look at the themes that would have pertained at that time. It was all, all the talk was of cross-sectoral round tables and sustainability. Um, and partnership, and we did it in partnership with Antashka. Antashka did it with the Department of the Environment and Dublin City Council and um, some European body. <clears throat> I also then remember about 20 years ago uh, organising a conference on environmental taxation or environmental fiscal reform, as we actually called it at the time, uh, with the European Commissioner. Um, then Minister for Finance, Charlie McCreevy, snubbed it deliberately and quite humiliatingly for us as organisers. And I think it's no harm to remember some of the attitudes going back um, to that particular year, some of you, most of which have probably changed. Um, uh, but the message of that, that conference was tax goods, not bads, uh, and also make it fiscally neutral so the worst off don't have to complain about environmental taxation, <clears throat> lessons that we still haven't learned. But I suppose my point is that um, environmental vogues come and go, but I just reading the, the Greenhouse Framework paper, I think that's maybe less likely to, to dissipate than some of the other themes of yesteryear. Uh, I remember uh, during my time that a, a big concept was the power of one. Don't hear too much about that. The smart economy um, is one that's, that's gone. Sustainability was a buzzword then, uh, and I'm glad to say that it still is, but it seems to have passed from cliche into popular uh, so from cliche to popular, it, it never became uh, comprehensible or comprehended, despite obtaining the, 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 the uh, status of a cliche in the end. Agenda 21 buzzed for a while, but we no longer hear about that. Um, so I'm very pleased to hear that we're now moving to demand management and the circular economy. I think they're a sustainable concept that will pertain for the long term. Uh, and I'm pleased to see in that document so much radicalism uh, and that radicalism seems to be moving towards the mainstream. In fact, it's depressing um, in some ways to see that it's needed now, not just on an intellectual level, but necessary to safeguard the future of the species. Um, so I think everybody agrees that it's time a sense of, everyone here anyway will agree that it's, it's time that a sense of emergency was reflected in radical approaches. So we're going to move to discuss energy transition, demand and the circular economy. And the first speaker is John Gibbons. Um, so I've known John for, um, I think, around 15 years. <clears throat> um, we both did time on a committee famously called the Doomers Committee. Um, he's been a contributor to Village, which I edit for at least a decade. He's a brilliant debater and a great advocate. Um, and Pashka was never much good at communication, least of all when I was chair, but John is brilliant. Um, it's pity that broadcast environmental debates are always arranged and set up as a row, but thankfully he always seems to win them. Uh, and he's been a very generous contributor to Village, including for the current edition, which we're going to put to bed this evening. Um, so I don't really know how he manages to put so much high quality material together so often. John. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. And uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to be here today. Thank you, John, for, for having me along. Um, yeah, I, I read the, the document, and I know I'm not here to, to uh, if you like, to, to reboot that discussion, but rather I hope to bring it forward. I read the, the document, Rethinking Energy Demand, and I guess a few things uh, swirled around in my mind about it. First of all, it's great that we're having this discussion. For so long, it's, we've been hung up on things like efficiency and, if you like, tweaking around the edges, rather than saying, okay, this system is really, really broken. And I, I guess I spend a lot of my time trying, sometimes failing, to communicate to audiences unlike the people in this room. In other words, trying to preach to the unconverted and, in some cases, the, 
the unconvertible. So maybe today is a little bit different, so bear with me. But the issue, I suppose, from my point of view, really is where we start from, right? Degrowth. Okay. What do we mean by degrowth? How does an economy predicated on endless exponential growth degrow? Short answer, it doesn't. It collapses. We're already in an accelerated global ecological, economic, financial collapse. But collapse, don't think of collapse as off a cliff. Think of it more as falling down the steps of the stairs. Different people, I guess they say the future arrives at a different pace. Some people, farmers in Central America, for example, they're already living in the collapsed future, where the climate system upon which their entire existence is based, that has existed for hundreds of years, is gone. Their lives are over. Their new lives are, as will be for tens, hundreds and thousands of millions of people over the next several decades, their lives will be the lives of the climate migrant, of the displaced, of the destroyed, of the ruined. None of this is in the mainstream debate. This is fascinating to me as a journalist, as a human being, that somehow or other this is fenced off psychologically emotionally and put into a box called the environment. Asher, the Greens are looking after the environment, lovely bunch, harmless poor devils, but they're great. And they're looking after the environment and we give them two or three percent. Asher, we give them a fifth preference. They're grand, sure, I know your man, you know that fella, he's grand. Bit soft, but they're grand, right? That's where environmentalism is in the politics of Ireland today. Real people, serious people, the grown-ups in the room, as we call them, have no interest in this discussion. So, for example, when we talk about, say, the changes that are happening in our ecological system right now, right? we all know about the 1.2 degree global average surface temperature. That, by the way, on the surface where people live, in other words, the land surface, is already 1.9 degrees on the land surface, okay? Now, we know, of course, where 1.5 average takes us at two. But I find often it's so difficult to translate that to people and say, well, that's nothing. Sure, it was, you know, 14 degrees this morning, it'll be six degrees tonight. What's the problem? So again, as a communicator, I try to simplify things, hopefully not too much, but enough. And to say, imagine your kid is sick and your kid is running a temperature of 38, 39, 40 degrees. That's just a couple of degrees off the baseline of 37. So what happens to your kid? You get them some paracetamol, you cool them down, and hopefully they recover. If you don't, if you can't, then they begin to go into organ failure because the core temperature, our own body's core temperature, for all the 7.8 billion humans on the planet, our core temperature is 37, give or take. Once you leave that, basically you're into a bad place. And the reason I use that analogy is that... I'm sure you're all familiar with the nine planetary boundaries, this whole concept that's come out of the Stockholm uh, Institute of Resilience. Now, six of those nine planetary boundaries have already been breached. Some of them very, very badly breached. Can we recover these? Who knows? The future is uncertain. But what we do know is, if again, as a communicator, I try to simplify this, this is the equivalent of multiple organ failure. And the problem, of course, as we know, is that you can be the healthiest corpse on the slab if your liver fails. Every other organ in your body may be absolutely flying, but it doesn't matter because that key organ takes all the other systems down with it. We're in a situation globally of multiple organ failure. The problem here is anyone in this room who thinks that we're going to fix it, look around you, look at each other. We're the same people in the same rooms 10, 15, 20, 30 years later. And by the way, I defer to those long suffering people who've been at this so much longer than I am. I don't know how you do it. I've only had this blight in my life for 20 years, right? Uh, and actually I'm only 32, you wouldn't think it. But this is what it does to you, right? But, um, but look, we can't look away. 
this is reality. This is what we face. We can't look away. And besides, everybody else is looking away. So we have no choice. Morally, we have to stare into the void. We have to look this thing right in the eye and say, what do we do? Because as I said about that collapse thing, collapse is already happening in so many different parts of the world. It will continue, but we don't know at what pace, we don't know at what, at what rate, but we do know like a, I suppose like a ripple in a pond, those waves are heading out. At the moment, people in countries far away, who we never hear, never in the news, and we don't really care about all that much, they're already getting washed away by the waves, but those waves are heading faster and faster in our direction. So the notion, the idea that somehow or other, we're gonna ride this one out, I'm afraid that's not the case. Um, I suppose I sometimes think of the analogy, if you remember the, um, the, 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 the cartoon of the Roadrunner, remember the coyote and the Roadrunner? Yeah, that the um, coyote invariably ran over the cliff, I looked left, looked right, everything was fine, looked down, Boom. But I would like to think we're not facing that kind of a cliff or even like the coyote that we can fall, dust ourselves off and continue for the next cartoon because there's still absolutely everything to play for. That's the thing. But from my point of view, what's so frustrating is that we're still having, if you'll pardon my French, bullshit conversations. The idea that we're somehow going to carry our existing civilization, our consumerist civilization into the future with us, as if that was even a good idea, by the way. I'm going to be doing something later on about Halloween, right? About Halloween has become the new Christmas. It's now become this gigantic festival of one single use waste. And this is happening, by the way, in the teeth of an ecological emergency. Parents amusing their young kids. And these are parents who you would imagine would have such a strong connection to what's coming down the line. And the question I suppose that leaves me gasping is how did we end up so completely detached and disconnected from, from it? And I suppose, I remember going to a, a lecture in, in Belfast just before lockdown with uh, George Mambio, who I'm sure most of you know very well. And he was describing the rise of neoliberalism. And he basically said that after the, oil shocks in the 1970s, societies were, were displaced and shocked, and they were looking around for a new idea. And luckily, the neocons had been working away on this for 30 years, and they basically said, here's an idea. And everybody went, oh, okay. We used to think this is completely nuts, but now that you mention it, you really seem to have thought this out. So we're gonna run with that idea. And essentially that's what we've done for the last 40 years. We've taken neoliberal turbocharged capitalism and blasted ourselves off a cliff at the worst possible time. And the point that he was making when he said that is, those who in times of crisis have the best ideas, they win. We have to be prepared. There's a bunch of fascists out there right now, call them eco-fascists. I see them online all the time. They're rubbing their hands, by the way, in glee at ecological breakdown. They want to use it to amp up hatred, racism, xenophobia, close our borders, kick the foreigners out, all that kind of stuff. That is coming. There is that narrative out there. And you will find a version of, of, of green that you really, really wouldn't recognize and certainly would be horrified to be associated with. But we're going to be hearing a lot about environmental fascism. So my point is we need better ideas, much, much better ideas. Now, I think, by the way, in the document, I think we have some of those ideas, absolutely. Where I was left struggling a little bit when I was reading that is, it reminds me again of that, that, that childhood tale of the troublesome cat, all the mice, and they were constantly being harried by the troublesome cat. So they got together and they came up with a brilliant plan. And the plan was, when the cat was asleep, they were going to come out and pop a bell around its neck. It'd be brilliant. Until they decide, well, who is going to bell the cat? And that's where that particular plan ran into the ground. I'm still struggling. And I say this with the greatest of respect to people in the room here. I want to know who's going to bell the cat. Who's going to get the alarm bell around the neck of the system that is dragging us over the edge. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, John. Um, so we now have um, three speakers who are each going to speak for um, quite briefly for about five minutes each, um, starting with Claire Downey from the uh, Rediscovery Centre based in Ballymun, which focuses on recycling, sustainable fashion, education and research. And Claire is a researcher with a focus on reducing energy demand. She has a degree in chemical engineering from the University of Queensland and used to work for Indiver. Great. Thank you very much um, to Tommy Simpson and John Gormley for the invitation to speak. I'm very pleased to be here uh, to represent the Rediscovery Centre as the National Centre for Circular Economy, also as a board member of Green Foundation Ireland, and to be part of the conversation about this really far-reaching uh, report. So I'd like to make the connection quickly between the circular economy and reducing energy demand. And um, I think I'll start by illustrating it with an everyday product that we all have and use, or most of us have and use. Um, if you start to take apart a mobile phone, as we saw um, Minister Asheen Smith take apart a disposable vape, interestingly, on Twitter recently, you'll find 300 components and 85% of the stable elements of the periodic table. So there's an incredible amount of resources just in this really small piece of equipment. And those resources are extracted and processed and shipped and assembled and shipped again probably and assembled again somewhere and finally retailed before they reach us. So an average mobile phone costs around 80 kilos of carbon to produce and there are 3.5 billion of them in use right now, excluding what we've already uh, wasted. And that's just mobile phones, smartphones. It's not other types of phones. It's not your devices. It's not your IT equipment. When we start to think about one simple product, you can see very quickly how much goes into our products. And most of that is around energy. When we talk about carbon emissions, we think about transport emissions. We're transporting products. When we think about agriculture, we're making food. It's not a thing farmers do for the crack. It's an actual production system that leads to food that leads to food waste and all of this adds up into our energy demand. And so the Ellen MacArthur Foundation estimates that around 45% of global greenhouse gas emissions are associated with the extraction and production of our goods. And around 90% of biodiversity loss as well is associated with this activity. So we absolutely need to talk about energy demand and reducing energy demand by reducing our consumption. And in Ireland, we have some statistics from Eurostat about what we're consuming here, and they are quite surprising. Our consumption um, footprint, uh, which measures the impact of the goods that we use here, that we import, the energy imported through the products we use, is the second highest in Europe. We know that we have extremely high textile consumption. We're the fourth highest in Europe on that, depending on which figure you look to. We know that we have the highest production of plastic waste and the highest production of plastic packaging is placed on the market here in Ireland. We're not exactly sure why that is. Perhaps it's the type of statistics we're declaring, but I think it tells a story about our habits and our consumption patterns here that we absolutely need to address. There is obviously a lot behind all of this consumption. There's huge budgets behind marketing that's driving it. The linear economy is the economy at the moment that is still the most affordable, the most accessible, the most viable for business uh, um, as business as usual. And we are locked into this system at the moment. Um, we know there are lots of other benefits to circular economy, not just environmental, of course, there's community resilience. We saw that through the pandemic. There's skills, there's jobs and well-being. So we need to make a shift urgently to this more circular economy and keep our products in circulation and reduce demand for new products where the energy inputs are. We have seen a lot of change in Ireland recently. We've seen huge shift in policy. We have a new minister for a circular economy. That was good timing. And a new circular economy unit, two dedicated units in the department, as well as a new strategy, a new program. And um, soon we'll also see a new national waste management plan for a circular economy. So we have seen great momentum there. And now we just need to see that policy put into practice. We need to see how we can build on the vision um, to lead Europe in the circular economy. We need to see real focus on these prevention, the reduction piece on reuse and repair, on the targets that we hope to see come through for reuse. 
And we need to see all the different ways we can make it as easy, as accessible and as affordable and viable to be more circular. One area I just wanted to mention in particular that we're very involved in at the Rediscovery Center is in communications and behavioral change. And I know communications is only a small part of the picture, but we do think it's really important. We have done a survey recently that found only 25% of people understand the term circular economy. I know there was a discussion earlier about language and use of language, and we absolutely need to see how do we describe this better and communicate it better. Um, and also, how do we engage citizens in this journey? How do we do more, for example, participatory decision making, which I know is in the report as well. And we've done a little bit of work in that area recently with the food waste roadmap, trying to involve people in how we design our policies and how it impacts them. So I think, um, I suppose in terms of the recommendations in the report, I thought it was really interesting that the same recommendations applicable very much to energy transport, energy consumption, also very much apply to circular economy. So how do we avoid excess consumption? That's the very basic principle of circular economy. How do we repurpose and share and keep our goods in circulation for as long as possible? And how do we supplement existing products with better designed products that will last for longer, that can be repaired? Um, and I think all of those, um, as I said, absolutely align with the um, with the circular economy principles. So those are my reflections on the report, and I hope that um, helps to stimulate some further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, our next speaker is Davy Phillip from Cultivate. Um, Davy currently manages the Community Resilience Programme that developed out of the Community Power Down Programme in 2010. He was a founding member of FASTA um, and of Sustainable Projects Ireland Limited, the company behind the Eco Village in Clock Jordan. In 2000, he set up the Sustainable Ireland Cooperative with Ben Whelan, which trades as Cultivate. And with Cultivate, he organises networking and learning events, including the annual Convergence Sustainable Living Festival and the global green area of the Electric Picnic, Ireland's largest music and cultural festival, amongst other things. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks, everyone. So I'm switching position now from my usual role of facilitator to maybe just sharing uh, some reflections and insights from the work that I've been doing. I really want to highlight two projects uh, that I did in this uh, this. Uh, um, energy, what do we call the climate emergency economy project uh, the GEF has been running. So with, G, with Green Foundation Ireland, uh, I did uh, two processes that led to context papers. This one on a question of scale, which was really about imagining a cooperative, a community-led approach to regional resilience, to local resilience. How do we cope in our local places uh, with these cascades that, as John says, we're not going to fix we're going to have to to learn to live with uh, many times so we we explored old ideas like the commons and cooperatives uh, we've got a rich tradition of cooperatives in this uh, country mostly still sort of focused on agriculture with creameries and marts but people like Plunkett and A. A. Russell when they were going to run the country uh, the principles of coming together uh, the Plunkett Foundation in the UK have taken this much further now with energy co-ops, community ownership, community-owned pubs, community-owned shops. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, there that I think can help us reduce our demand, but also increase our resilience. I I'm always cautious when we hear uh, that our big challenge is emissions uh, reduction, where really we need to rethink a lot of things that we do uh, that sustains us. Um, the, the process uh, brought together a number of people that contribute to, to these papers. And then we continued uh, last year with food sovereignty, local resilience, and climate action, taking the same approach. How do citizens engage in this? How do we come together as communities and local places and really put in place the things that will help sustain us, but also um, help us reduce our emissions, our energy reduction? At the heart of a lot of this, and we've heard a lot about degrowth uh, today, uh, it was mentioned there that I was involved with FASTA, still I'm involved, not as much now, but many of you will fondly remember Richard Douthwaite, uh, who passed away 12, 13 years ago now. But to over 25 years ago, he wrote The Growth Illusion, and many of us were informed by that. Richard also, with FASTA, brought over Herman Daly 
uh, and other ecological economists that really inform Kate Rayworth's work that's been mentioned here. And it's so important that work now that gives us that common framework to understand, as Orla said, this ecological ceiling or the thresholds that the Stockholm Resilience Center have identified that we cannot afford to cross, we can't afford to overshoot. But at the same time, building this uh, social foundation or social floor where we can uh, meet everyone's needs. So I think there's new frameworks that we introduce here in, in this paper that are becoming uh, more important in thinking about how we move towards uh, a well-being economy, if you like. And with FASTA, recently I was involved in setting up the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. These are uh, hubs all over the world now that are really looking at how do we um, inquire into what the proper function of the economy is and not right now as we see that we are society and the environment in service of the economy and market. How do we turn that around and ensure that the economy is acting in service of society and the protection and regeneration of our ecosystems? So I think there's, there's a, a lot there that um, the well-being economy, I think, can sometimes be a healthier frame than degrowth, which says what we don't want. But what do we do? What do we want? And one of the projects, the Wellbeing Economy All Ireland Hub has Peter Doran in Queens, has the Derry Playhouse. It's really starting to look at what we need a new ecological social imaginary. How do we imagine what good living is, what the economy is, what a wellbeing economy might be? And so we're starting a project that's just been funded by Carnegie UK to really employ the power of the artists, the creatives, to help us imagine what this is, to lead social dialogue and new social imaginaries that may help us be clear on what is good living? What are we aiming at? Because right now I think we're floundering around a lot. At the core of this is a worldview shift. It's a, a shift in the way we're thinking, not the reductionist way that we've been educated and cultured into thinking where we break it through the parts, but starting to see systemically or an ecological worldview where we see relationships and connections. And I think that's at the heart of the principles of cooperatives, collaboration, connections, mutual aid, self-help coming together. And we're gonna need these ideas, ideas like the commons, uh, new cooperatives, platform cooperatives, new ideas of ownership, new ways to engage uh, society in exploring what this economy is for and how do we get there. So I just wanted to introduce that as a, a way to still the conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, Davey. So the, the last speaker in this session demanding the circular economy is Rosalind Skillen. Um, Rosalind joined Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful in February of this year, having studied French and Spanish in Cambridge. She seeks to demonstrate how communication, creativity and storytelling can help address the climate crisis. She campaigns with various charities and businesses in Northern Ireland to advocate for strong environmental policy and to promote climate action. Um, and she communicates on environmental and social issues in her week, weekly column in the Belfast Telegraph. Thank you, Rosalind. Yeah, thank you so much for um, inviting me today. Thank you, John. And I'm just going to offer a few reflections on these two themes that kind of came through. So reality and opportunity. And I think today we've talked a lot about reality and for a lot of people here it was really refreshing to see that it was really striking in some ways this idea of disrupting the status quo when we don't hear a lot about that so when I was reading the report the report I was really encouraged by that and this idea that we cannot continue with cultural addiction to consumerism and I feel like a lot of people have already said this just elevates the conversation and takes us to kind of a new realm of understanding like it's going to mean a lot less driving a lot less flying lower meat and dairy consumption more walking and cycling um, and in some ways for people who are maybe like less familiar with climate that's a really hard pill to swallow I think and that's where the second part of the report for me was so helpful in the sense of opportunity so trying to move away from this green austerity nav narrative which environmentalists are sometimes guilty of in terms of what we have to give up and what we have to lose in this new sustainable future and instead asking the question about what we have to gain and I think that's so valuable because the transition to a sustainable future is going to entail so many different ways of living but in my view this is going to be a better quality of life for most people it's going to mean clean air 
improved health and well-being, enhanced connection to the world around us and to each other, and a more democratised, localised production of food and energy, for example. So I think in so many ways, as a lot of people have already mentioned, including Peter earlier, the report challenges us to use values in order to engage different audiences about how to transform this reality into the realm of opportunity and to make um, the hard pill to swallow in some ways easier to hear, to say, to understand. Um, and a, lo a lot of the work that I do, I work with loads of different groups um, and I've learned quite a lot about how to yeah, change your communication style. I know Joan was talking about that earlier, but for example, um, for the environmental charity I work for in community gardens, the people are not there to like increase biodiversity or reduce carbon. A lot of them are there because they're really lonely because they've got poor levels of mental health and well-being. So a lot of the time we're promoting um, community gardens and climate action then through the lens of health and well-being or maybe social co inclusion or um, cohesion. And then if I'm talking to a faith group, you're trying to tailor the message, not necessarily to do with the climate science, but more with the values and principles of justice and compassion, talking about stewardship and creation care. And then maybe if you're talking to a business, it's about green jobs and the fact that um, more young people are interested in ESG, environmental, social governance. Um, and I think that the report highlights as well the nexus between health and climate, which I think is really interesting. It talks about even the richest people can't say that they don't care about health. Um, and when I was at the climate strike in Dublin a few weeks ago, I found it really interesting that the Irish doctors for the environment were there and they were talking about how um, the climate crisis is gonna impact people's health. No one wants to breathe in dirty air. Um, so again, I think there's just so many different lenses through which we can land this message that are really effective. But I think the big challenge for environmentalists and for people in this room is relating the environment to everyday concerns. So like jobs, skills, food, in a way that engages more people. And it shows us that tackling the climate crisis and tackling inequality aren't mutually exclusive. So it's this challenge in a way to mainstream environmental concerns. Um, and I think when we frame the climate crisis in terms of people's values, we start to explore the more emotional aspects of what moves people to take action. Um, so in many ways, like the head, the heart and the hands. So um, the logical outworkings of why we need to take action, the science behind it, that's the head, the heart landing the message more effectively in terms of values, like adhering to what they um, hold in terms of their value systems and their beliefs. And then that mobilizes the hands that enables people to take action. So the head, the heart and the hands are so, so important. And I just want to conclude by saying what this report makes so obvious and it was highlighted this morning is that all of this is a political choice. And I feel like so often it feels like this is happening to us and we don't have a sense of agency, but um, it's really important to remember that none of this is inevitable. And it's a result of private interest being privileged over public interest um, and symptomatic of how vested interests are so, so embedded into our political systems. And I you know we talked about the av aviation industry and the fossil fuel industry, who like both of which have a really long history um, of shaping government policy to suit their interests. Um, but we need to remember that insufficient solutions to climate change are not solutions. Um, and the gap, not only as the report highlights between reality and opportunity, but between reality and ambition um, are both getting larger. And I think that we can no longer afford to see climate change as a 2030 or a 2050 problem. Um, as people highlighted this morning, Ireland was the second country in the world to declare a state of emergency in 2019 um, about the climate crisis. And I'm sure a lot of people are asking how their lives have changed in any significant, meaningful way. It doesn't feel like we're living in a state of emergency. Um, so I guess to close, I think we really need to respond to the climate and nature crises as if our lives depended on it, because they do. Thank you very, thank you very much, Rosam. So we're now going to have a panel um, discussion. I'm not quite sure what the logistics of this are, but Davy might help me there. But with the with the last speakers for for 15 minutes, I think there's some sort of elevated status to John in this um this process. But um, I was proposing. So I think maybe if everyone comes up here, is that the easiest? Yeah, to fulfil the because panel, we've thanks. got this uh, online participation and there's people from all over Europe engaged in this. Uh, the panel is going to have to be here. We don't have a seat. So if John Gibbons 
uh, and and uh, Claire and Rosie want to join us up here. And we've only got 10 minutes before we have to introduce the minister. So I don't know, is there something? Okay, so so I, I, I just thought I'd um, uh, just put a little bit of structure on it. So I, I did um, draft four um, potential questions that might be helpful given this limited time. Um, so I suppose I was thinking maybe that what, what's the simple message from the um, greenhouse framing document and about demand management and the circular economy, uh, then how do you communicate it? Um, are we availing of current crises um, properly? And maybe it's traditional to look for measures about implementation of an agenda like this, other ways that we could be pushing this with the Greens, given the Greens are in government at the moment. So I suppose the simple thing, the first thing maybe is if we just talk about messages that come from today or from the documentation that is guided today. I think John is our leader. <laughs> yep, I, I, um, I guess to, to come back to some of the things that, that uh, we have been touched on over the last uh, couple of hours, um, we're not where we want to be in this. Uh, we would like to be um, 20 years, maybe 30 years back, starting off to manage an off ramp uh, to to get to where we need to be. Unfortunately, we 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 wasted all that time, so we now find ourselves in a in a in a crash scenario. And I think so much of the work that's going to have to be done um, is for for my for my mind is about preparing people for uh, what's coming. And as I think I used the analogy earlier about the future happening at, at in. It is here already. It's happening at different paces and different rates in different parts of the world. So I kind of, you know, that thing on an aircraft, and I'm sure nobody in this room flies, but think back to when you used to fly. Uh, they had this sign that said, you know, in the event of an emergency, put your own mask on first, right, so that you can help others. I kind of see the people in this room and maybe hopefully rooms like this as being like that. We're kind of getting our own mask on. We're protecting ourselves. We're, we're girding our loins to be able to help other people through the very, very difficult times ahead. John, John can I ask how in particular you would suggest communicating um, messages about demand management and, and the circular economy particularly? Because they don't exactly swing off the tongue and they're having to change popular sure well i was listening to morning ireland this morning as i'm sure many of you were and i was listening to the weather forecast and the weather forecast is sponsored on our national broadcaster two and a half years after the declaration of a national climate emergency by a company that sells oil-fired boilers right now you tell me exactly again michael how we're supposed to communicate the climate emergency right this is cognitive dissonance folks right for every one crumb of messaging they hear from outliers like me there is a avalanche of buy more do more fly more mm. now that's what we're up against and that's why i say put your masks on first can I build on that? Yeah, sure. Just uh, can I build on that? Just what you said there, John, about the weather. What an opportunity with the weather forecast for us to say, well, look at the potential for solar. Look at the potential for wind today, or that we've made this much because uh, the wind was that way. So just as a as a thing to maybe connect. And um, I suppose things like circular economy are difficult to conceive if we're still thinking linearly. If we're just thinking the take make waste, the sort of a linear economy, a debt-based, a growth-based. It's difficult to imagine circular economies and resilience and sustainability and still we start thinking ecologically. So I think the narrative aspect of the report uh, and uh, what we've heard from the other speakers is so important. The, we've got to shift the worldview, shift the narrative into thinking systemically. Uh, even the sustainable development goals, quite flat, 17 platitudes we've heard all our life. But when you see the work the Stockholm Resilience have done to look at it in nested systems, where you've got four goals for the ecosystem, you've got four goals for the society, the eight goals that are for society that's nested in that ecosystem and nested within society is the economy with four goals. Then we start to see the function of the economy in service of society and environment, not as we currently have it. Uh, that we are in service of the market and the economy. And what do speakers th think about the virtues of telling the unvarnished truth? Or do we need to pull our punches on these things not to, to, to scare the horses? Uh, Rosalind? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's um, really important. I think 
um, it's really difficult to frame your message sometimes. And I think it just really depends on reading your audience. That's what I always come back to because I think that's um, who you're speaking to really depends how you tailor your audience. Um, and especially in terms of making language more accessible, because I think a lot of the um, climate movement and a lot of the vocabulary that people use is like acronyms, abbreviations, um, and even words like carbon and net zero. I don't think people realize how far they need to break it down. Like how do you visualize tons of carbon and and like again that's where the creative and cultural sector comes in being able to communicate that message more effectively but um i guess there's a real communications and education piece when it comes to a lot of the language that we mainstream um in rooms like this but actually aren't obvious to people and i think that helps to um break it down a lot more there we with you on that yeah absolutely agree with Rosalind that it's about framing um and thinking about the audience and what they want to hear i suppose um yeah we're um just completely forgot my point sorry <laughs> so i'll come back well, to that i remember one. in my time you weren't allowed to criticize um capitalism um and at the moment you get into trouble if you suggest car sharing and it's perceived that you can't speak the truth about food because of the rural lobby and john would have real experience of that so how, how do you deal with that um with with difficulty um uh, it was mentioned in the report, the vested interests have the seat at the table. They're the ghost at every banquet in Ireland. Every time you hear somebody in authority, somebody, some politician uh, speaking, you're also, in many cases, you're hearing a reflection of the people who have the best and closest access to them. Present company excluded, of course, I should. But it's a serious point. Um, the lobbyists have undue influence on all our public life in Ireland. And we know that uh, it's, it's so obvious. And I know you're what you're setting me up for there, Michael. Thank you. Uh, like we have an agricultural lobby that is almost uh, untouchable in this country, that is driving our emissions and our water pollution, our air pollution, all our measures going in exactly the opposite direction, uh, effectively scuppering any chance of us meeting our 2030 goals. They're gone because of the power of one lobby to basically torpedo uh, a meaningful public discussion on this and to, to turn it into a culture war where mm -hmm. when you want to address scientific reality, it becomes you're attacking us. And this we've seen this played out in the US, if you like, in a more extreme way, but where people won't engage with reality and instead want to turn it into something about wokeness and all that other nonsense. So that's the challenge. Right, just came back to me there. Um, and a little bit building on what John just said, I suppose in terms of communications, obviously we need to be making these messages clearer and more understandable, but we also need to make the solutions more accessible to people. So it's all very well to say you need to be, you know, always um, uh, bringing your um, refilling a coffee cup where you need to always be buying secondhand or you need to always be doing, you know, repair but um, how accessible and how easy is that and how affordable is it? So in terms of this disconnect between where we want to be, which is very much highlighted in this report and the big system change that we need to go through to get there, I think that's the big challenge. Can I add just a touch of that? I, I think just building on what Claire's saying there that we need to illuminate these responses and these solutions. We don't see enough of the stories of the community actions and the things that people are, are doing. I often, uh, working with communities, talk about housing co-ops, food co-ops, uh, energy uh, co-ops, car clubs, and, and these things people are, are, I don't know much about that, but it sounds interesting. And I think to give people a, a sense of hope and something they can engage in, these are the stories that we need to tell us, Claire Singh. I was always in favour of telling the, the, the truth, I guess, as unvarnished as possible, because it leaves the best legacy for the next generation of environmental people, rather than pulling your punches so they have to deal with issues that haven't maybe been as resolved as they might have been. Just Does anyone have any ideas about um, how we might avail of some of the uh, crises that are um, ruining all of our lives at the moment to, to make progress, um, particularly on, on energy, I suppose? I've not much to say, but never let a good crisis go to waste. I think there's an opportunity here to build momentum for new ideas, for new ways of thinking. 
and just again on the same vein, I'm sure you've all seen this famous cartoon, uh, and it, it's it's one of these eco conferences, and the guy uh, down doing the presentation has you know clean air, uh, healthier children clean water, et cetera. And the cynic up the back says, yeah, yeah, what, what if it's a hoax and we build a better world for nothing? Yes. That to me really strikes right to the core of this. Almost everything that we can do to address the ecological crisis actually improves our lives. It may not increase our consumption. It may not mean that we get to fly as much as we like, but by, by every indication of human welfare and wider ecological welfare, all the changes that those disruptive greens are threatening will actually lead to a better world. And we really need to keep that in mind because the, the narrative of doom, <clears throat> present company included, we need to be super careful to remember that under that narrative is the possibility, if we don't screw this up, of a better world on the other side, a different world, but maybe a better world. Okay, I'm afraid I'm under, um, under pressure to wrap up this session. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. Thank you. Um, um, the, the next um, session is the circular economy and demand reduction and um, a keynote speech is from Oshin Smith, um, who is uh, a Green Party politician who served as Minister of State since July 2020. Um, he's been a TD for Dunleary since 2020. He was appointed Minister of State at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform with responsibility for public procurement and e-government and Minister of State at the Department of the uh, Environment with responsibility for, the, for communications and which, of course, is most important for us here today, the circular economy. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, it's nice to see so many familiar faces. The circular economy, there's a problem with it. Problem with the, the naming, I suppose, the branding, because it's two abstract ideas. It's, you know, that's something being circular, which is too many syllables to get across and being an economy. And um, I think it really helps if you can quickly skip to the examples of what it really means in, in, in the real world. So it, circular economy means that instead of uh, going to a cheap shop to buy to buy clothing that you're going to um, the charity shop and that when you get shoes in the charity shop and they wear out that instead of buying new ones made in a sweatshop on the other side of the world that you go around to your local shoemaker and you get them fixed and then you get your clothes altered and that you get your bike fixed and that everything is that you you try to renovate and that you you reach for an idea that there is um, that one of the the pleasures of of get things and looking after things and buying things can doesn't have to be about brand something being brand new. It doesn't have to be about unboxing. Uh, it doesn't have to be about taking home a haul of goods out of new, new bags with branded with the name of the shop. But you can also have an immense pleasure from taking your old goods and fixing them up. The ones that have that uh, that that have have worn in to fit you and that have some heritage and some emotional connection for you or that you've got it from your family and now you're you're giving it a new lease of life and that that can be a, a way that you can uh that you can signal to other people your 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 uh your taste and your eclecticism rather than appearing and saying look i've got something brand new from that from that brand so i think there is a cultural challenge to shift people's um uh, shift shift people's idea of uh what it means to to provide for themselves and their family in a way uh, which is which is which is not wasteful. So I think we're kind of pushing an open door here. Uh, for a long time, there was a general consensus that um, our our prosperity and our wealth in the world were about the success of capitalism, and that what we had to do was we had to consume as much as possible. I need to remember George Bush telling people that we to avoid the recession, we all had to go shopping. And there was an idea that if anybody like Michael or me said hold on a second, maybe GDP is not a good measure of wealth, that you are a, a crazy hippie and that you should be shunned uh, for your silly ideas. And then eventually the whole, the whole edifice of GDP sort of collapsed. And you know, I remember, you know, there was this idea every quarter, well, GDP has gone up half percent, we're half percent better, or it's gone down half percent, we should be worried. And then one day I think Irish GDP went up 25% and the CSO and everybody had to say, oh, this, this, this is all rubbish, isn't it? And it doesn't actually, it doesn't, it doesn't work at all. And we've got to find another way of, of measuring whether we're prosperous. And that, that this idea that we can measure our prosperity 
based on how fast we are consuming our finite resources is a stupid idea. And that that is it, it doesn't make sense to say the faster you eat the food in your cupboards in your kitchen, the the the, the richer your family is. That that's that's just not true. So we've won the kind of we've won that kind of argument, and there's a general consensus from people that consumerism is not the route to happiness. That if you have two of something, you're not twice as happy as you were than when you when you had one. Uh, it's in fact it's more rubbish to look after. And even that even IKEA eventually said that we'd reach peak stuff. And everybody knows, you know, stuff is stuff is not going to make you not going to make you happy. Um, so we're we're there in the abstract, but we're obviously not there at the individual level. And still still it's it's very hard to get past um, uh, you know to, to to make those individual changes and say okay I accept that. I shouldn't uh, that, that buying a lot of stuff isn't going to make me happy, but I'm you know I'm, I'm still doing it. I'm still borrowing money to, to buy stuff. So, so we're 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 at that point. We're we're at the point where the general idea is agreed and the goals, but we we've got to do the we've got to do the action plan. How do we persuade people for this circular economy stuff? So, um, and I see this in the report. You know, when you're trying to persuade people about things, you've got different groups of people, and you need to address their values. So it's easy for me, I suppose, it's, it's if with a group of people who are young and progressive, you might speak to them about circular economy in terms of the environment and the future and climate action, but maybe with a, with a more conservative group of people, you might be appealing to the values of their parents and grandparents. And using that approach that I went, brought the circular economy um, uh, bill to the Doyle, I was able to get people from every party, including the rural independents who generally will oppose anything that I do, even if the, even if the opposition are on side, but it got them to, to agree to it because they said, oh yeah, that's the way things used to happen where we used to get our shoes fixed and whatever else. So, 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 so being able to appeal to that, those values meant, to get, meant that we got a very broad uh, consensus. Um, so on an individual basis though, when, when we're looking at uh, the getting people to agree to projects in their local area, um, there is a real there is a real problem it's really heartbreaking when you're trying to get things done in your area and people are coming up and opposing them so if you can think of something as simple as closing off the street outside the local school during school start the start of the school day and the, the school pick up and the drop off so you just say well why can we close the 100 yards from under the school and I, I guess the problem that we're having is that we put out an idea and we say let's have a public consultation about it and then People start to imagine all kinds of terrible things in the future, and they discuss it for years, and sometimes literally two years, three years of discussion about something that you just really want to try for a few months. So I think we, we, what we really need to do is move towards uh, um, a different emergency governance to, you know, to take it into account that we're that this is a, a, an emergency and that there's a climate crisis, and that we say, look, if we're going to try something out, like close the road in front of the school, we should just do it. Um, and we'll just announce it that we're going to do it next week and we'll try it out for we'll try it out for six months and then we'll put it back the way it was and then you can have your consultation so we're consulting about something that we've tried not something that we're imagining for the future because what i found is that in, in my local area when i surveyed people and i got a professional firm to survey it they were actually very very much in favor of a lot of the projects i was trying to do but the people who were against the projects had louder voices they were more intense they were more on social media and they gave the impression and also to the broadcast media that they were a majority. So I have a kind of a silent majority supporting and I have a minority who are kind of acting in a tyrannical way. So that's that's my that's my challenge to get past that. And so I want to move towards if we're thinking about what's emergency governance which is covered in this I think something where we can we can do something and have the have the consultation afterwards. There's a couple of things happening in Europe that are encouraging. One is um, the idea of durability ratings. So you go to buy a washing machine and um, you, you see an array of machines and you're picking based on brand or you're picking based on super features that it's gonna wash using AI or whatever. And really, you're not really making an informed choice and you don't know whether the product is gonna last a long time or whether it's got built-in obsolescence. So the, one of the ideas from the EU is that they are going to have an independent body testing all the consumer equipment and giving it a rating for how many years it's going to last. So, uh, so you you go in and you see this washing machine lasts for five years. This one lasts for ten years. And now, as a consumer, you can make. So I shouldn't say the word consumer. As a citizen, you can make you can make an ins informed choice. As this is this is the, I'm I'm going to buy this one, which lasts twice which lasts twice as long. Um, and 
you know, when I discussed that at a, at a, at, with business people, one of them said, well, what if I own a washing machine factory and I only get to sell half as many washing machines as I did before? And that's the vested interest angle is, uh, you know, th this thing you're trying to bring in, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lower it's going to lower my bit. It's going to lower bit my business or businesses overall. But of course, it creates a new opportunity, which is the opportunity for the whole business of renovation and repair, and a lot of that work is local rather than being globalized. We're also kind of got a fair wind on the whole globalization thing, because globalization is obviously falling apart. Uh, thank you very much, Donald Trump, for imposing uh, trade tariffs on loads of different countries all at the same time, which made co companies say, okay, we've got to put our own factories in each continent. Then the pandemic, uh, uh, just destroying trade lines in China and everything else, and now the war in Ukraine. And really, we got to a point where if you, you, you just can't rely on very, or it looks like that the business world can't rely on fragile, complex, long distance supply chains. And they're thinking we've got to make things more locally and and create things locally so there's a there's a challenge to the whole idea of um of globalization i think is really is really starting to sh starting to shatter and i think that so, so what's going to happen instead I, I think is a lot more um a lot more local stuff a lot more services a lot more fixing things in your in your local area and a lot less waiting for a, a, a container of stuff to arrive from the other side of the world how are we doing on circularity in ireland really badly so i think we're second last in in ireland in in europe on Eurostat circularity index. I don't say that very much, but we are. And um, when I looked at the details of it, because we don't mine, we don't really have much mines. We have like Tara or something. Um, but what we do is we scrape a lot of aggregate and uh, we take, you know, we, we, we scrape off drumlands. And until recently, of course, we were stripping the bogs and everything, but we strip, we, so our construction industry involves a lot of a lot more raw materials than in other countries in Europe, even on a comparative basis. Um, we ship all our waste or most of our waste, although it gets sorted here, most of it ends up being sent abroad, a lot of it um, burnt abroad. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we've, we, we have a lot, we have a long way to go. I've put in the law that we need to reach above European average in eight years time. And when I look at what the big bits are to do, it's not coffee cups, that's the bit that you know, obviously that the media were interested in, but the, the biggest one is construction. So if we're going to build loads and loads of houses for people, are we going to build them in a green way? Are we going to uh, renovate the existing stock? Are we going to are we going to have low embodied carbon? Are we going to reuse materials? When we knock down old things, are we are we taking all the rubble and throwing it in a field, or are we recycling concrete and so on? So that's going to, that's that's the largest opportunity area is construction and development for improving our. Uh, our circularity those little things like coffee cups and vapes they're things that people can relate to and i suppose you know they do on their own each one of them is so tiny you know plastic bags whatever but it is worth doing each one of them because they are something that you can you can relate to uh, in your own life and people do want to have a sense of um a sense that they have a role in all this and that they have some kind of control i'm very heartened by what i saw in california where when they were reaching their um they, 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 their electricity network looked like it was reaching peak and that they, that they might have blackouts. And they sent texts out to people and said, in your area, we might, we might be reaching a blackout. Can you find things to turn off around your house? And um, the response was phenomenal. And um, I think, uh, you know, you see a huge drop very quickly, but, and you could see that people then uh, felt that they had managed to avert a problem, that they had some agency in it, that they were given the information. And also it, it, the message was sent to everybody, whether you're a child or an elderly person, and everybody can, can, can have, a, have an act in that because everybody can look around and, and turn something off or do something. So I'm looking at um, how we can do that here as well. So there you go, that's my unprepared words on this. And if you ever want to talk to me about circular economy and you have ideas about uh, how it should be running better, um, I, I, I love to hear them because mostly everything that I've ever done is any good has always been a suggestion from someone else. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Joaquin. Um, so we now have a 20 minute question and answer session. I'm not quite sure how we're going to um, well, uh, handle that. But... We did it earlier. <laughs> we have a challenge where anyone who wants to make and at this stage, probably not a question, would be good a response or a, an insight, a reflection would be useful. The questions, there's a, a number of questions that came in online, but the physical persons have to come up here and sure, make their you statements. To okay. So again, an invitation, if you'd like to make a, a, a reflection or an insight, if you want to come up, we've only 10 minutes for this, then we're passing on uh, to Sai for a fi final reflection. No, but less. 15, say. 
Anyone? So let's start with uh, you in the green jumper. Just as you're coming up, I'll just read some from the online participants. Uh, Paul Leach, uh, Rosalind is right on the head, heart and hands. Uh, leaping into action at all stations to the flourishing positive motivation, countering the pushers of addictive consumerist behavior in late stage metastasized capitalism on our public service broadcasting is no easy challenge. Has to be called out, Paul Leach. You're very well. Uh, thanks very much to all the speakers today. It's been really interesting. And, you know, I was speaking to the gentleman I was sitting beside saying, you know, it's great to be in a room where people agree with you and then you go outside into the real world and um, most people are complacent or they're ignorant of, of what, what's ahead of us. So I uh, just in relation to uh, what the minister had to say in relation to the circular economy, I think a port, an important part of that um, jigsaw is universal basic income because part of the difficulty is with our money system in order to get access to money, People have to get a job, often they're bullshit jobs. Um, people are doing really important work. They don't actually get any money for it. So rearing children, being at home as a carer, all of these jobs that actually don't attract money um, um, are a problem. And then we have jobs that do attract money like you know, excessive um, chief executive um, pay and stuff like that. So just in relation to the money system, I don't know if anyone has any comments in relation to how we can look at progressing the idea that actually people should be actually getting a certain amount of money because in order to uh, exist in the society, the circle economy won't work if they can't get access to money. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, obviously, universal basic income, the experiments with artists that Catherine Martin has in place, so it shows the potential of that. Um, and again, Richard Douthwaite, his other book was called uh, Short Circuit, which was all about uh, local exchange trading systems and ways that we might uh, uh, move forward. This session as well, we can have questions for the minister as well here, if there is any. Um, two here, three here. Let's be as concise as we can, because we've only... Yeah, but looking at the minister right now, so I had a question for him as well. Um, the government has allowed, basically, to uh, for some companies to invest actively on fossil fuels. And also the government is also uh, providing a substance um, to, to the fossil fuel industry. So in what sense, you know, the government is, uh, a, you know, willing to start, you know, looking at banks, voucher funds that are making the money of the life, you know, with the, with the war when it's happening right now. And uh, Ireland being one of the countries that attracts, you know, high tech companies and all these uh, uh, investment uh, uh, companies is, 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 is amazed to me that the government is just so soft in how they deal with uh, these uh, corporations that are basically, you know, killing our environment, is killing us all of us. I will treat them like the Russian of you know, invading Ukraine. So they are inviting, in, invading our, our environment as well, and they should be punished. <laughs> you want to respond to it? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure Come on. Can say. So I, I think I, um, I'm not entirely sure uh, what you're saying. Like I, I know that um, corporations can, uh, they are, naturally psychopathic I think they, they they're very much focused on making money and if you let them they will just they will just keep going and eat everything and destroy everything until they can get to to, to the other side there so that that's what that's what what it is and unless they're regulated and unless you control them in some way then uh then you know that that's what they do they're they're sort of machines for making money and if they can externalize their costs in some way and put all their pollution in the river and put it in put it in the sea they really can and for, i suppose for a long time in ireland there was a view that um we had to let companies we could give them we could let them do whatever they wanted if they're going to make jobs because the greatest thing we could ever have in a poor country was it, that we, we could have jobs and particularly foreign jobs and foreign money and we could bring that in and if you complained about the river you know you were an enemy of the people really and so so now uh, we're we're at a position where um it, where th there's a lot more uh, material wealth and that people care more about protecting the environment. And I think that there needs to be very strict regulation of companies. And that's what that's what everybody wants to see. So I, I, I would agree. 
Okay. Okay, and um, we'll have Karen in here. Um, so Karen Dubsky, if you want to come up, and there's just uh, I'll maybe read another one from the online participants. There's quite a number of online participants today. Uh, thank you for engaging and asking some questions. Uh, Carolyn White from FASTA. Oh. Uh, hi, thanks for this very interesting event. I'd echo Davy's point earlier about the powerful role of narratives and on the well-being economy being a useful term because it focuses on what we want in the future. Degrowth and post-growth are useful concepts too, but they're means rather than ends. Also, while it's true that a lot of people recognize now that we've reached peak stuff, uh, governments generally haven't. You might sometimes hear them say nice things about other values being important besides growth but you'll never hear them say that growth is unnecessary. There's a structural reason why governments are still so fixated on economic growth. They're afraid they'll be unable to sustain their debts if their economies don't grow, and that this will scare investors off, leading to currency collapse and bank runs. It's entirely possible to bell this particular, to, to bell this particular cat. Uh, it's been, <laughs> it's been uh, done before but we need to recognize the cat is there first, a reference to you. Karen Dobsky. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a really inspiring, but just something very small, concrete, which I'd love to see. If the minister would invite RTE to a meeting with the thoughts which are here on how to actually, what is their role? Why have we got so much on sports and so little on environment. Why when I have had something, they say, but we dealt with environment two days ago. Environment should be there every single day, like the weather forecast is there every single day. So an invitation to RTE to review their terms of reference, the space given to environment and climate in this time of emergency would be just wonderful. And then maybe just one other thing. We need a product impact assessment. Yesterday, I met a new water pistol on the shore, but I didn't recognize it because it was made of three different types of plastic and didn't even look like a pistol. I met it again in a shop today and it cost three euro. It's new, he said. The kids will love it. This is crazy. So either a tax, or a ban, because people don't like bans, maybe a good tax. Thank you. Do you want to come up I, I, again? Um, and I'll, pardon? Yeah, come on up. I'll just read one out to Sean, from Sean O'Farrell. Come on up though while I'm reading it. Uh, Sean O'Farrell says, will we see the reestablishment of a platform such as SMILE, the resource exchange, uh, a national industrial symbiosis program providing a platform for organizations to identify synergies with an unwanted resource waste in one organization can be utilized as a resource in another. I don't know if it's a direct question to you, Minister, but I think that idea of industrial symbiosis, again, is systemic thinking, is circular thinking, and definitely uh, waste equals food. You know, So there's no waste in nature. We could design an economy to reflect the way nature works. Okay. Oh, this has been a very inspiring meeting, I must say. I just want to make three quick points, having agreed with almost everything else that's been said. Um, the first one is that we always talk about the minimum wage, the universal basic income. I think there should be a maximum wage because we live in plutocracies where the rich rule, the billionaires get to decide what happens, not the people. So um, redistribution and maximum income is my first point. The second point is GBH, which for some reason didn't come up which is the gross, um, gross happiness indicator, as opposed to GNP, GNH, gross national happiness. It was set up by the King of Bhutan in 1970s, and they've got now something like 33 indicators that could be integrated with well-being, because well-being would obviously be, you know, an overall thing, which happiness is a big part of. And the third point is when I saw, heard about the Rediscovery Center in Ballymun, I immediately looked it up and thought, fantastic. I have a, every furniture in my house, every piece could be sent. And then I looked it up and I said, not accepting donations and not redoing your furniture right now. Now that to me is a great, useful business opportunity. If anybody knows anyone who's already doing that, let me know. And I think it's something that would be a very useful addition to the economy. And then the economy could be a useful addition to life. Thank you. Thank you.
So just checking again, anyone in the room want to make a final reflection? Michelle, Eric, well, bring them in. Michelle, come, let's be as brief as we can. So Minister, I want to ask you, I want to talk about the kind of communications gap that I feel exists between our government and citizens in this country about the, 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 the need, speaking to the heart of people, you know, about our children's future, whatever audience, whatever message you message for different audiences. It seems to be completely lacking, you know, I mean, I, I see ads for how to sort of go around roundabout or whatever on our national broadcaster, but there's nothing there that's speaking to people's hearts saying, this is really how bad it is. This is what you have to do. Uh, you know, speaking to people on an emotional level. We have all the head stuff. We're, 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 that's everywhere. So as well as, as speaking to the national broadcaster in terms of their remit on the environment, why is our government, why are we not speaking to people? That's the gap, you know. We're all here. Great. We're all in, this, we're all in a bubble. You know, everyone I work with, everyone I know, don't really care. Their hearts aren't engaged. And until we do that, we'll all just remain in a bubble talking. Thanks, Michelle. Eric, we'll take you. Um, winning hearts and minds, definitely essential what we do. Eric, if we can be as concise as we can. The one use cup, since COVID, it's just unbelievable. It's taken off the amount of one use cups I see is just incredible. People just don't seem to understand. People now hold, uh, what you call it, um, compostable. They think they're doing the right thing, but that has to go in a, a brown bin. But it's still actually um, uh, one use use of the Earth's re resources. So uh, I asked the minister, we need to have a, a, a coffee latte levy, can't come in quick enough, and the deposit return scheme for bottles needs to come in very quickly. That's certainly a circular economy thing that we need to go for. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, everyone. Eileen McDermott, Green Foundation Ireland. And I just want to highlight that the National Council for Curriculum and, and Assessment are currently looking for submissions on the proposals for a new um, subject at Leaving Cert level at this late stage, and it's called Climate Action and Sustainable Development. And I would urge everyone here who, can, who is part of an organization or is an individual to make a submission on this important subject. And it has been mentioned in this excellent paper also. Thank you. So just checking again, so Phil and then Gavin. Three footnote two, that has been a fantastic seminar. Subject that wasn't mentioned, civil disobedience, non-violent direct action. It's interesting that it didn't get referred to at all. And it occurred to me, it's a, there are people in this room who take part in that kind of action, but didn't mention it. So it occurred to me that if we really want to under the circumstances of urgency that we now face, we're going to have to take those kind of actions. And half the group in this room were to occupy either RTE or the offices of a fossil fuel company. We could very dramatically change things, but it will take that kind of action and we will have to be prepared to take the consequences. Um, just one point around uh, the circular economy that I think we really need to be cognizant of is the whole issue of status. I think that as a species, status is a huge motivator for behavior. Um, it's clear that, you know, a high status lifestyle is an attractive lifestyle. Um, and I think, you know, just classic uh, cultural messages, Love Island, you know, nobody wants to go to Love Inish Man. It's, it's, about, it's about how we actually frame this in a way that people who are status motivated can actually receive status by engaging in such things as circular economy. Because unless there's something in it for people who are motivated by that kind of worldview, I think we will continue to preach to a certain type of people who are looking for the kind of stuff we're talking about, which is more ethically motivated perhaps, or that has a, a personal uh, growth issue aspect to it which doesn't satisfy somebody who wants you know a high-speed performance motor car or suvs which are still outselling electric vehicles so i think that's an important part to consider nula uh, Hearn is going to make a statement and i'm just checking if there's any please put up link to the okay sorry i'll leave that nula 
just to say that when I was first elected to Wicklow County Council as a Green in the early 90s, and I tried to initiate a conversation about waste, I was soon responsible for all the unemployment in the state since 1922, <laughs> according, according to my political colleagues. Um, so we, we, I would say, don't say should ever, I would say how, certainly why and how. Please let us not lecture people who still feel they need basic stuff because there are a lot of people out there who do feel that and who deserve to have electricity, etc., done in a different way, but in a way that is sustainable. So that those are also part of our world, those people. So we mustn't just be talking to Europeans, uh, even just Northern okay. Europeans, let me say, but there is a lot that we can do. And I'd just like to ask the minister, do we have a role for 3D printing? in uh, the circular economy, because I got very excited a few years ago about that and its potential uh, for local use. And um, I'd like to hear what you think. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Nuala. The, the, the role for, for 3D printing, I think, is in um, parts, you know, parts that you can't get anymore. And there is, uh, there's, it's now one of the EU rules is that, you, is that manufacturers have to provide parts I don't know if that needs to be strengthened, but you know you're you're missing some little piece of plastic in your whole machine or your car or whatever is 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 obsolete. So bit, so that I think that's the role for for three D printing. Um, so there you go. Thank you. And I'm going to pass back to Michael um, for a bit of a close of this session, and then we'll have our final reflections. Um, thank you very much, um, everybody, for their contributions. I'm just going to synopsize, um, infused with my own um, prejudices. Um, both from from the from the um, from the document and some of the discussion and some of the questions, etc. So just very quickly, quick, I'm going to race through. Um, well, I think ten um, important uh, principles that we're beginning to learn. First is the power of one isn't enough. We have to change the structures, uh, and we have to change the government, and we have to somehow work out how to deal with vested interests. Um, second point is that the precautionary approach is important. Uh, and it suggests that we rethink demand rather than gamble on future technologies as our way out of all of this. The third point is we need to change indicators away from GDP to quality of life and sustainability, and we need to monitor those um, indicators very stringently. Uh, and in particular, it looks, for example, like we're way off with our um, with our carbon emissions targets. I think that document suggests that certainly in Britain that they need to be reducing by 17 to 27 percent um, year on year. Um, the fourth point is that there will be disruption, um, in other words, some reductions in standards of living, and I think we have to face up to that. But on the other hand, this is likely to mean a lot less driving and flying, lower meat and dairy consumption, more walking and cycling, more public transport, etc., more democracy, more localised provision of food and energy, and reasonably warm homes. So 1.5% increase is completely, in, 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 uh, limiting to 1.5 uh, degrees is completely compatible with lifestyles that involve improvements in people's quality of life for most people. Fifth point is a particular uh, issue for me is the power of litigation um, if um, environmental targets uh, aren't reached. Sixth point is the importance of centralizing notions of frugality and self-sufficiency, which have been unfashionable uh, in all of our generations. Seventh point is a particular one for the magazine that I'm involved with. We, we, we're driven by um, a few precepts, but one of them is environmentalism and another is fairness or equality. And I think environmentalism actually flows from that. It's about getting, ensuring that the next generation has an equal right to participate in the fruits of the earth as we had. So it's important to, be, to, to make sure this transition is, is, is fair. Uh, the eighth point is to avail of prices, of which there are a good number, unfortunately, in many ways, in many ways at the moment. Ninth point is to work with human psychology. It's important to work out what people can take and to, and, and, and to be realistic about it. And I think an interesting point there that Phil made was about the, uh, the power of direct action in, 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 in affecting that. Um, tenth point is that we need to accept that taxation should be not just for equity, but also for other purposes, including if we believe in environmentalism, it's legitimate to tax across the range for uh, environmental purposes, not just for the, the plastic bag or, 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 or on, uh, on carbon, but um, ultimately for sustainability and for 
quality of life, a radical new view of taxation, not about, um, not just about equity, about redistribution, but about pursuing environmental agendas through taxation. Then my fi final overall point, which is um, borderline a fetish for me, uh, is to emphasize the importance of numerical targets enforceable through justiciability. Um, measure everything. Uh, who otherwise, how, how do we know? How do we know at the moment how we're doing for biodiversity? We haven't monitored it properly. We don't know whether we're actually reversing uh, decline. We assume we're not, but it needs to be monitored much more stringently. Um, so we need to allow people to go to court if they're not getting their rights um, to sustainability, they are rights to sustainability and to, um, to quality of life. So, so set targets, make them enforceable. Uh, and allow people to pursue them in the courts if they're not, if we're serious about changing some of these um, these agendas. So thank you very much, everybody. And I'm now going to finally pass over to um, Sai for some final thoughts. Well, like uh, Michael, I'm going to uh, give a few reflections infused with my prejudices. And thank you, Michael, for reminding me of how old I am. Um, the most important thing I heard today, I think, and I think it really speaks to the kind of audience that we are, this little community here, and we're a subset of a bigger community of green activists and thinkers and practitioners and politicians. We have to have the best ideas. Uh, I, that just really rang out for me. And that is why I think we spent so much of this afternoon without maybe thinking we would, talking about communicating, about how to communicate effectively, what messages for different audience, the importance of winning the argument. Where would we be without you, John Gibbons? Because I engage in these arguments, but I don't win them. <laughs> It is really hard to win the argument because it feels like you're in the heat of battle and the battle itself feels like a sign of failure. But in fact, of course, it, ha it has to be that truth telling that speaking truth to power is so important. So we need to mind the people who do that for us. We need to mind the people who speak the truth to power because they're actually very vulnerable a lot of the time to attack and to being abused uh, or uh, manipulated or taken out of context or you know, the usual slagging on social media and all of that. So winning the argument, we should never take anything for granted. It's not easy. And the other thing is reversals happen all the time. So you win an argument and then you find two years later, you have to do the whole thing all over again. Change of government, new parties. Look what happened in the UK. I mean, we won't need to discuss that, but you can see the possibility of reversals happening because some ideologue gets into a position of power and can just with the stroke of a pen do mad stuff, absolutely mad stuff. The messages, as Rosalind was so eloquently telling us, that relate to people's lives. If we are talking in these highly complex uh, vocabulary around emissions and concepts and mandates and you know, all these very abstract ideas just don't relate to people's kind of bread and butter concerns. And that's a challenge for every single one of us who's engaging in any kind of communication. Um, guilty of it myself, in academia, we always default to the most complicated version of anything that there is because there is such a focus, a fetish on novelty of argument. And that is a distraction. Anything that does not communicate effectively is a distraction. And we need to think in terms of not so much um, the kind of complexity of definitions of degrowth or the different ways of approaching it. We're actually at the point now, uh, as many people have highlighted, of triage, of like, who do we save first? It is literally that bad. The kind of choices we are facing are profound in terms of their ethical consequences. But if we don't confront them, if we don't stare into the void, these choices will be made by others or they won't be made at all. And we just have that kind of cascading effect uh, with the attendant uh, loss of um, you know, agency that, that we spoke about earlier. So I wanted to say a couple of things about leadership because I don't think it's an accident that you know, it's the Green Economic Foundation and the Green European, Green European Foundation 
and the Greenhouse and so on, and the Green Party that has been behind this particular document and the conversation today. As we spoke earlier, it's practically taboo. No political party can put a chapter called the solution is degrowth into their manifesto. In fact, I checked the Green Party's manifesto for the 2020 election, and there's no reference to degrowth anywhere in the manifesto. And I don't blame anybody for that. That's not a, a criticism, but it's revealing of how difficult it is to put certain, certain words into the public domain. So if degrowth is not the word, well, Forget it, let's find something else. Uh, Jonathan had a great suggestion that I didn't write down. But the other thing that I, so yeah, but I'm sure you'll tell us whatever it was that you, you had used post growth, wasn't it? It was post growth, right. So let's, let's talk about that. If that makes it easier, let's not get dogmatic about language because we're in a place that's going to be full of innovation and experimentation in any case. The thing I wanted to say about leadership is so important. We need to not be afraid to lead. Nobody else is going to do this work. Nobody else. Where would we be without, you know, Oshin and the other members here who have stood up, put themselves before the electorate, or stood like Manuel up against his own employer to highlight uh, their climate inaction? That takes great guts and courage. And we need to support the people in whatever walk of life in whatever way is appropriate for them, whether it's the tomato soup brigade or the standing behind the people who throw tomato soup and defending them and supporting them with fundraising or with legal advice. So, Phil, I was going to mention direct action. <laughs> and it is it's one of those perennial dilemmas that many of us who are now in our middle age, it's like, well, what have I actually accomplished? What have I actually done? We've been doing this for so long, and what have we actually accomplished? Now, okay, we can talk about public awareness, we can talk about column inches, coverage on the radio, but what have we actually accomplished? It's so depressing, it's so depressing. So I can understand the impulse to just get out there and be seen to take some kind of radical action, however symbolic, that drives the message home that we're failing, because actually that's what's, what's happening. So hats off to those people. I just think they're heroes. And um, it, it, it speaks to me again about the need to find better ways to involve and communicate and engage with young people. And I was thinking of you, Rosalind, particularly, because Michael, having pointed out how old we all are, <laughs> Make me, you know, realize I used to always be the youngest person in the room. And as the years have gone by, uh, with many exceptions here today, but that's sometimes still true. That, that's not funny. <laughs> that's really not funny. So what I mean is, where's that intergenerational transfer of leadership roles? And I think we have a lot to learn from you with your amazing communication skills about how to speak in a way that not just hands things over, but then creates the space for young people to step up and take the mic. I'm very conscious of the space that I personally occupy sometimes in the media. And I don't know why that happens. Um, I think the media is lazy. It keeps coming back to the same voices. We need to find ways of making that kind of transfer happen. And I'd love to hear at some point what you think we should be doing about that because it's not right there's something desperately wrong about the exclusion of young people from uh, these conversations um let's be troublesome mice for a change mm -hmm. i have a few suggestions um one of them is for you davy um i i was just really alarmed when i kind of realized the demographic issue here <laughs> michael he's gone now um, I think you should facilitate a band reunion. I think you should pull together people who've been doing this for a long time, particularly around the climate communication. There's a huge amount of amazing work that's been done in the UK around how to communicate with different audiences, climate outreach, many of you will be familiar with. But we don't really have a similar thing here and the audiences are different. We have different kind of electoral system, with different political parties, and we have different kind of civil society messaging that's going on. So I'd love, I don't know, I'm just going to hand that to you and see what you think. I also uh, loved hearing from Jonathan 
a, a his story about how he got the avoid shift improved concept into the policy domain and then how it worked its way through the system. Like that's kind of a bit nerdy policy process stuff, but those kind of working examples, whether it's an eco village, whether it's a, a kind of a nerdy policy process in a local authority, we need working examples of how to do that. And we need to skill up people who are willing to stand in local elections and do the same thing in their area, because it's not easy. You stand in front of people and you say, I want degrowth and cycle lanes forget it. But if you maybe deploy some of these things we've talked about today, perhaps we might make a new generation of green and green like candidates more electable. And that should be our focus because we cannot avoid politics in any of this. All of these issues are so deeply political. So let's go and be troublesome mice. Thank you. Thank you, Saif. Uh, we've come to the end of the day and for the closing remarks um, from GFI and the former Minister for the Environment, John Gormley. Well, thank you very much, Davy. Um, it's been a stimulating um, afternoon, I have to say, and it, it now falls to me to thank a lot of people and the wonderful Anne O'Connor and has given me a list, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, the Lord Mayor for the use of the Oak Room, Deputy Lord Mayor Darcy Lonigan, uh, Jonathan uh, Essex and Peter Sims for your great presentation. Thank you very much, Greenhouse Think Tank. Uh, Sive O'Neill, and Sive, uh, you are not middle aged. Where's Sive? I said. So if you're not middle aged, because you see, the problem with that is it makes the, the rest of us look absolutely ancient. <laughs> so I'm not going to tolerate it. Um, Orla Kelly, Michael Smith, Claire Downey, Rosalind Skillen, and Minister Oshin Smith. Uh, and I just want to say two things here. I mean, I was so, uh, it's so wonderful, uh, you know, that we have young women coming forward, uh, making contributions. and. When we put together this program, uh, I was very conscious of that, to get new people in, because sometimes it's the same old, same old, right? To get new people in, making a contribution. So I'm very pleased about that. And I'm very pleased that uh, Oshin took the time out because I know what it's like uh, to be a minister, to be under huge time pressures and to take the time out and to answer the questions. Oshin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, I've. I've thanked Nuala Hearn, I've, uh, well, I've thanked Anne O'Connor, um, but I want to thank Nuala and Seen Hasker. Seen was wonderful yesterday. She put us right on all the technology and if she's listening in, Seen, thank you. Uh, Davey, of course, great facilitator. Uh, Tommy Simpson, um, you know, the redoubtable Tommy. Where, where would we be without Tommy Simpson? Thank you, Tommy. And I've also been asked, again, Anne is very, very thorough as you all, all, all know, I have to mention this, right? Um, if any of you have taken photos and are happy for the Green Foundation Ireland to use them, please uh, send to Anne, okay? Send to Anne at info at greenfoundation.ie, okay? If you've taken any photos. What? Greenfoundationireland.ie, is that all right? Uh, this is, I've been told, a free event, uh, but there is a donation box uh, on the registration desk, and please give generously. And Anne is pointing to it right now. Uh, the GFI's next event is, believe it or not, and in the context of biodiversity, it's very important. Earthworms, see the flyer. It's on Thursday evening, 10th of November, 2022, at 7.30 p.m., and it's online, and it's talked by Mark Hodson, professor at the University of York, and you can book now on the website. So as I said, it has been an intriguing afternoon. Um, at the break there where you were eating the wonderful cakes, and now you'll, you'll be indulging in alcohol now pretty soon. But um, I asked a friend of mine, Joe O'Byrne, and I said to Joe, what do you think? And he said, yeah, it's good. He said, but it's not hard enough on the Green Party. So uh, I says, well, look, I do that at the end. Uh, so it falls to me now and I have to, at this stage, 
do a mea culpa because uh, I was 20 years as a Green Party representative, 40 years campaigning in total, John, you'll be glad to know. And during those 20 years, I did not mention, and Saif, you're absolutely right, I didn't mention the concept of degrowth enough, or I didn't mention post-growth. I didn't, probably because of the stigma almost attached to it, in that you are immediately branded as an economic illiterate. And the argument is over before it even begins. So maybe that is why, I don't know, but I suspect that is why it wasn't in the Green Party uh, manifesto. But I do recall that when the EPA was set up, I was in a studio with Mary Harney out in RT about 1990. And I did say, if you enshrine the concept of economic growth in this legislation, the EPA will never work. And it has never worked. We have put in huge resources into the EPA. We have talented people in the EPA. But as long as we're growing, 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 every indicator is going to fail. Whether it comes to our emissions, our biodiversity, it's impossible. And that is why I personally feel that for the rest of my life on this planet, I want to talk about post-growth and degrowth and talk through communications, talk through films. And all of this event has been filmed because it's the only way. And I'll tell you, I got married, believe it or not, my reception, my wedding reception was in this very room 28 years ago when I was Lord Mayor uh, of Dublin. And on that day, it was unseasonably warm. Uh, beautiful day. And it was, believe it or not, 15 degrees. This week, you know this, it's been 17 degrees consistently. So it's happening and it's happening now. And, um, you know, and, you know, John, you've spoken about the frustrations. When I was Lord Mayor, I spoke at the very first conference of the parties in Berlin. I gave a keynote address there, believe it or not, along with the president of the Maldives. And we got a, a, an amazing reception, standing ovation. And we said at that particular, this is the very first conference of the parties, that we had 10 years to fix this problem. And you know what? It was actually true. We did have 10 years back in 1995. We don't have 10 years anymore. Right. And one of the most depressing things, and there, there have been depressing moments. There's no question about it. Um, 2009, Copenhagen. I was there as minister and it was a washout. It was a failure. It was a disaster. We had such high hopes going into that. And then we had the so-called breakthrough of Paris. And you know, I think about Paris and say, yeah, God, is, is, this the, is this the breakthrough? Because you all know this. Even if we implement everything in Paris, we're still going to 3.2 degrees. Our chances of hitting 1.5, you know, the ceiling, the 1.5 degrees, they rate, you know, it's 99%, 99% against, right? Right now. Where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us fighting and fighting and fighting. And it's complex. You know, when we're talking here about communication and the narrative, and I hear this, and I, I know a lot of science colleagues out in DCU, and they're great. One of them, Pat Brereton, can't be here today. And I, I, I say to them, well, look, look, you know, and theses, many theses have been done on this. How best to communicate this? You know, do you frighten people? No, you paralyze them, apparently. But you see, I don't necessarily go along with that anymore. You know, this softly, softly approach, the sugar coating. Adam McKay, who did Don't Look Up, recently said, you know, and um, he's into this, how do we communicate better this whole issue? He said, like, would we make a fire alarm sound like a Brahms symphony? We wouldn't, because it serves a purpose. It's there to frighten the life out of you, to get out of there quick. And so we're treating people like oversensitive consumers the whole time. And it doesn't work. In my view, it simply doesn't work. Because right now, I'm telling you, if you go just down the road here, uh, and I'm very familiar because it is my old constituency, and there are two parts of the constituency. There's Sandy Mount and there's Rings End. I live in Rings End. Rings End is the working class part. And then there's Sandy Mount. And the Sandy Mount people are very wealthy and they're feeling very good and very virtuous at the moment because they're all driving around 
in their electric cars. No electric cars in Ringsend, but they're driving around in their electric cars and many of them are getting huge grants from the government to, they're actually insulating the homes and it's grand. But as soon, as soon as you ask them to do anything which inconveniences them, they're not on for it. We want to take one, you know, row of traffic off from the Strand Road. And I had the misfortune during the general election to actually knock on a few doors there on behalf of the Green Party. And guy comes out to the door and he says, do you realize, this is how they speak in Sanyo, he says, do you realize, he says, that if you take away that lane of traffic, it's going to take me 15 more minutes to get to the airport. And I do a lot of international, I do a lot of international travel. And, you know, obviously he didn't say, but he was going to say, I'm a very important man. But he didn't say that. The fact of the matter is that they don't, still don't get it. They still don't get it. You know, during here, and I would just say to my, our British guests, during the war here, we didn't call it the war, we called it the emergency. And it was an emergency and it was treated as such. So there was rationing. We had cars put up on there. Still, no cars were allowed, only if you were a doctor. And that, if, if this is an existential threat, and Michal Martin, and I have a lot of respect for Michal, has said this, this is an existential threat, then we should be treating it as an emergency. And the softly, softly approach has to go, right? During COVID, there was no softly, softly approach in terms of communication. I mean, what we had was, and I remember this distinctly, in the first few days we had, you know, these images of people all dressed up in masks and people spraying down and everyone was frightened in their lives. I remember actually going down in, in, uh, in rings and, and pressing the, um, you know, the pedestrian, you know, the, for the lights. And then my wife saying to me, you've just touched the bloody light. You're going to be contaminated. You know, that's how frightened, that's how frightened we all were. But... It worked. It got people, it got people motivated. We're going to have to say to people, this is an existential threat, and this is what's going to have to happen. Uh, and, um, you know, eventually, I believe myself that when we cross the 1.5 threshold, 1.5 degrees, maybe that's when the penny is going to drop. I don't know. Um, but I'll just finish on, on this one, maybe a hopeful note. Um, I think... Uh, you know, Gavin mentioned um, Love Island, Inishman, and we both know Inishman, and I love Inishman, by the way. Uh, you know that. But the phrase they have there on Inishman is always Quinigi Ort, you know, keep going, keep going. And that's all we can do in Green Foundation Ireland. You know, you, you have these moments where people say, well, you know, are you being overly pessimistic? The very fact that you're gathered in this room means that you haven't given up. It means that you are going on and that you are persisting. And that is the most important thing, that sort of persistence. So thank you for your persistence. Thank you for, for your participation. And let's go out now and have a nice drink. Thank you. And uh, thanks to the online participants, uh, we'll close this. Uh, there's still quite a few of you online, so thanks for joining us. It's interesting having these blended events. Sorry if I didn't uh, get to your comments, if you made some. Uh, but thanks again. We'll see you next time. All the best.